Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. Uh, I'm Brian Crane, and I'm today here with Friederike Ernst, and we're going to speak with Jesse Pollack. He is the head of protocols and the base contributor number one, base being the new uh, roll-up uh, based on optimism that Coinbase is launching. Uh, so really excited to have him on. and. Just before we get started, I uh, would like to tell you about our sponsor this week. So our sponsor this week is Omni, which is a fantastic multi-chain mobile wallet. They support 25 protocols that you can, so you can manage all your assets in one place. And what's really cool about Omni is what you can do inside the wallet. If you want to get yield, then they allow you to get the best API, APY fees in, in a few taps. If you want to swap, then they aggregate bridges and decks. So you can do that from in there. Uh, if you like NFTs, they also have really broad NFT support, so you can collect and manage your NFTs across chains in one place. So it's really uh, the easiest way to use Web3 and it's fully self-custodial. That means you don't have to trust anyone with your assets except yourself. And it also has ledger support. So give it a try at omni.app. So with that, Jesse, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, y'all. I love Epicenter. Longtime listener. Huge fan. Aww. Yeah, no, I like what you said before that you've like probably listened to like all the episode. That's pretty amazing. All, I don't I think, think there's a lot episodes. of people who've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening for like four years, five years, however long it's been going. We should give out NFTs for people who've actually listened to at least like 95% of the episodes because I don't think there's all that many of those. <laughs> it's almost it's almost 500 episodes. So it's, it's uh, a lot. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of episodes. I've been listening. I, I run three or four times a week. And if there's a new episode, uh, Epicenter episode, I listen to it. Cool. Cool. Now we're going to have this be a whole quiz about my knowledge of Epicenter for the next no, hour. No, no. We, we, we will just trust you. So, yeah, let's get started. I mean, maybe before we get into base, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this role of like head of protocols. Like, how did that come about? And like, what has what sort of your role been within Coinbase? Yeah, um, and I've been at Coinbase for six years at this point. About, oh, I guess I'm about to hit my six year anniversary. Um, I joined at the beginning of 2017 after having started a company that worked with crypto companies uh, back in 2013. Um, and for the first four and a half years at Coinbase, I supported all the teams that built our consumer facing products on the engineering side. So Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, Coinbase Wallet. I joined when those teams were really small, you know, a handful of people, and then helped grow them to uh, a couple hundred people. And then in the middle of 2021, I took a step back from that role and stepped into a new role at Coinbase, which is the role I'm in today, um, which didn't have a name at first and kind of had a singular mission. It was me and a really small group of people. And our mission was basically figure out how do we bring Coinbase on chain as a business? Uh, now, what does that actually mean? If you think about Coinbase, it was started in 2012. Uh, at the time you could just buy Bitcoin. There were no smart contracts. There was no kind of on-chain economy. Uh, eventually we added the support for buying Ethereum, Litecoin, a bunch of other assets. Um, and then really in the last few years, with things like USDC and Coinbase Wallet and CBE, um, we've started to have more what I would call natively on-chain products, which are products that are written as smart contracts or interact directly with smart contracts and give our, our users, uh, whether they're individuals or businesses or developers, access to the kind of the full power of this platform that's emerging. Um, but those products are still a very small percentage of our overall business. The vast majority of you know, the users, the activity, the assets are still in custodial centralized systems. And so for the last you know, almost two years, I've been working inside uh, you know, this, well, I think, 3,500 person, uh, Fortune 500 public company, trying to figure out how do we change that? How do we go from having 90% off-chain, 10% on-chain to having 100% on-chain over the next few years? And that's been a wandering journey, a lot of learning, a lot of failures. Um, and out the other side of that came Base, uh, which we think is going to be a really powerful platform, both for Coinbase, but also for the broader world to um, come onto the on-chain platform and start building really useful things that billions of users want to use. So Coinbase is uh, famously a publicly listed company, um, which means you have fiduciary duties to your shareholders 
right? So what's the high level business case behind uh, introducing base and uh, bringing Coinbase on chain? Because basically kind of just um, justifying that with ideology isn't enough for shareholders, right? You have to, you have, to have a business case. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at what Coinbase, what, what's made Coinbase's business over the last 10 years, I think what you'll see is that um, we've made money by making it easy for users to interact with and access crypto. And for the longest time, the thing that users have wanted to do in crypto is trade. They wanted to speculate. And so we've made money by making it really easy for them to buy crypto, sell crypto, hold crypto, um, do that in a secure way that's trusted um, with easy interface. But I think from the beginning, and you know, this is pretty well laid out in Brian our Armstrong, our CEO's secret master plan for Coinbase, which he wrote in 2016. The vision for Coinbase is to bring about an open crypto economy where there are millions of dApps that billions of people are using that are not just trading, not just speculative, but are actually things people have to use on the day-to-day -day life to go about the things they care about. And I think our thesis is that if we can accelerate the number and quality of those applications, then there will be um, tons of opportunity for Coinbase to continue building easy to use interfaces that are trusted for our users to use those applications. And um, we'll be able to make money off of that because users will be able to continue, you know, users will be excited about paying for the privilege um, or paying for the access that Coinbase will provide as kind of a gateway to Web3 or a gateway to the on-chain economy. And we're, you know, we're already starting to see this, you know, for instance, in Coinbase Wallet, um, we, we have a swap function there that works a lot like the, the swap function or trade function in Coinbase.com, but it's powered by decentralized protocols. It's powered by ZeroX and Uniswap. Um, but Coinbase can still charge a fee because it's really easy. Users can also go into the browser and interact with Uniswap and not pay the fee if they want. But lots of people decide to pay the fee because it's easy for them. And I think our thesis is the more of those applications, the more growth for the business, the more things for users to do, the more users who are going to be coming on chain. And, and all of that will be good for Coinbase's business long term. So it's kind of like an app store business model. Exactly. Yeah, it's an app store business model, but I think the thing we're excited about is it feels like it can be an app store, but it's not going to be a coercive app store where everyone's locked in and you have to, you know, build in a certain way or you have to, you know, pay certain fees. Um, because we're building on these open platforms, you know, things like EVM, things like the OP stack, um, it's going to be easier and easier for developers to opt in to, to being on base and, and being in the Coinbase product suite. And, and it's going to be easy for users to opt in to using base. Um, but if people say, hey, we don't want to be here. Or, hey, we want to go use applications elsewhere. I think our goal and, and, and thesis is awesome. Like that's what it's all about. That's what the open crypto economy is about. It's about having choice. Um, and we're going to continue supporting users to go elsewhere. And then we're going to let the Coinbase products win on their merits by making them easy to use, making them secure, making the things that people want to use because it makes their life better. I'm still not totally following sort of the, the rationale behind base. I mean, also, I guess one thing you're saying seems to be like, hey, we need to have more, you know, dApps, more stuff, and then that's good for crypto. And of course, like that, I understand that. But I mean, if it's just about building dApps and you feel like, oh, Coinbase needs to have a role in building more dApps so that we get more usage, then, I mean, there's lots of like chains or related to the rollups that are coming where you could put those on. So wh what's the case? Like, why build your own rollup? Yeah, and this is something we, we, we thought a lot about. Um, and uh, in the beginning of 2020, to the way this really started was we were working with our internal teams at Coinbase, trying to understand what was holding them back from building dApps, from building on-chain. And basically what we saw was teams were struggling with how do we build on-chain, i.e. like, are we writing Solidity and EVM contracts? Are we writing Rust and Solana contracts? Are we writing, you know, app chains and Cosmos? Um, and then most people were kind of by default picking EVM because that was, you know, the most popular thing. But then they were getting stuck with where do we build on-chain? Um, you know, do we do we put it on L1? Oh no, it's too expensive. Do we put it on L2? We're not quite sure where on L2. And so, first half of last year, 
um, we aligned as a business to EVM as a kind of primary development platform. That's what we saw the most growth, the most kind of uh, network effects from a developer perspective. Ethereum L1 is kind of the place we wanted to put high value applications. And then L2 is this place where we could start to deploy like large scale consumer applications, things that would reach millions of users. But even then, I think with that clarity, we still have the question of like where in L2. And so in the second half of last year, we went and talked with all the L2 teams. We're kind of like blown away by the level of creativity and innovation that was happening in the space. And I think as we went through that process, we had a really like big change in perspective about what L2 was going to look like from an architecture perspective. I think we started with the thesis of there's going to be one L2, it's going to be monolithic. And like Coinbase kind of has to pick the right one. And like, that's the most important decision for us to make. And then I think by the time we went through that process, we ended with this vision of much more, there's actually going to be many of these things. They're going to kind of run in parallel. They're going to gradually standardize and interoperate and work together to scale Ethereum. And I think in that context, like the why L2, why should we build an L2 question became more obvious. It was like, we should build an L2 because we want to contribute to that mesh or super chain. We want to help scale Ethereum. We want to uh, invest our resources in the platform. We want to give our teams and people who um, want to be building for our customers an easy like default way to do that. Um, and we can do all of that without being a silo, without being an alternative kind of like, you know, ecosystem being an island, but instead being deeply interconnected to what right now is the largest crypto ecosystem in the world. And then with a clear strategy and plan for how we can make sure that we like have even more interoperability between all the other people who are working there. And so I think that kind of like having the best of both worlds of like creating the platform where Coinbase from a developer perspective could really start to like make that transition, have the surety from a business perspective to invest in it um, while also being deeply interconnected was the reason like why we chose to, to do this. I think we'll speak much more about that, right? But you guys are building on like the optimism stack. And of course there's like other types of layer twos as well. Like what, in what ways do you see base differentiating or like, you know, what, what do you, what are you trying to do different than other L2s? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, building on the OP stack. And so we're obviously going to share a lot of the core technology with other um, L2s building on the OP stack, like Optimism mainnet. Um, and we're joining as a core core developer of the OP stack, uh, which means that we're going to be kind of dedicating our resources to making that as scalable as possible, as secure, as decentralized, um, which I think is going to pull up timelines on a bunch of things we really care about. I think in terms of the, the place where we think we can we can really differentiate, it's about kind of bringing together the kind of holistic uh, group of Coinbase products to make it easier for developers to build and then make it easier for users to use applications. Um, so on the developer side, uh, we have a whole kind of developer organization in, in Coinbase uh, and plugging base into that as kind of like, this just works out of the box with all of our developer tools is going to be really powerful for making it so, you know, someone who's just been writing JavaScript can get started and, you know, get started with an application and, and build it in, you know, 30 minutes instead of 30 days. And then on the user side, and I think this is the thing that I'm really excited about, we have 110 million verified users, something like, you know, 80 plus billion uh, assets in our ecosystem. And uh, like I said at the beginning, the vast majority of those are off chain. Um, and that's because it's easier right now for those people to hold their assets in custodial systems. And I think one of the theses that we have is if we take base and we integrate it into the Coinbase products like Coinbase and Coinbase Wallet, we're actually going to make it just as easy for those users to use the, the applications that people are building um, as they can you know, use the first party offerings from Coinbase today. And so what that's going to do and how it's going to differentiate the chains, it's going to bring all this demand um, from kind of real users into the on-chain economy where these you know, useful applications are starting to be built. And I think connecting up that distribution both through kind of the organic components of it, where users are just finding the applications that they want through listings or search, um, uh, which are products we're building into Coinbase and Coinbase Wallet, um, is going to be huge. And then also, I think one of the things we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to pull or start to build some of this infrastructure around paid distribution, where developers can be like, hey, we have this great product. We know what kind of users we care about and Coinbase can help them find those users and help the users find the product and connect that kind of market of demand in a way that's a win-win-win for the user, for the developer and for the ecosystem. Because now instead of this user kind of 
holding their assets off chain, they're bringing them on chain and they're starting to be a part of this broader crypto economy um, that's bigger than base, bigger than Coinbase. Uh, and, and we think is the kind of like platform for, you know, the whole world coming on chain over the next few years. Um, Jesse, you'll have to spell out one thing for me a bit more. So basically um, having a venue for your own people to kind of build dApps and having a venue to which you can kind of funnel your 110 million users, in principle, you didn't need a fresh chain for that or fresh rollup for that, right? In principle, you could have partnered with any L2 or even L1 to kind of make this happen. And basically, you know, you could have contributed to the to the technolo technology effort and so on. Ines, how much is um, kind of this starting from a blank slate, um, a regulatory um, a question in, 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 and in how much is that a business, um, decision because kind of it lets you gatekeep in, in some shape or form. I think it's, I think it's, um, and first of all, I, we're not starting from a blank, blank slate. And that was really important to us. We didn't want to go out and build our own technology. That's why we're working on the OP stack. That's why we're building as an Ethereum L2. It's why we're, you know, contributing to and building on top of these open source public goods. Um, but I think in terms of like why it, it is a business uh, reason, but it's not about gatekeeping. It's more that there's a ton of a ton of value in us having our own on-chain home. Um, and here's an example of this, right? For the last year, Coinbase has been investing in EIP 4844, which is an upgrade to um, Ethereum that's going to lower the cost of all rollups by 10x. Um, we've put a few engineers on that and we've brought up the timelines on that being live from like what was previously undefined sometime in 2024 uh, now to summer 2023. That kind of investment is now like totally makes sense for our business um, because we now have a clear rationale of like we have this home. We know that we need to make it more scalable because it's too expensive for our users. Like let's figure out what the underlying infrastructure is that we need to build in order to invest in that. And I think there's a bunch of things that are kind of like that across the whole company, where before we had basically uncertainty around like, okay, we have this application, where do we put it? Is here better than there? Is this going to work with all of our products? And now we've created certainty and surety. And we say, oh, no, we have the home. We can invest in the infrastructure. You can build the application. It will work by default. Like all of these pieces start to work together in a way that, is much more powerful than any of them individually. And so I feel like one of the big drivers for us on this um, from a business perspective was like the shelling point of the chain where it's like, now we have the reason to do all these things on chain. And we have the place where we can feel confident that if we do them here, they'll work for us. And they'll fit into, again, this broader map or super chain of other L2s, of other L1s, of Ethereum. Um, so we're not just off on our own, but we're actually connecting people into the broader economy. Okay. I, I, I do want to sort of clarify a little bit or, or, you know, expand a little bit on the question that Friedrike asked, uh, which is around, you know, to what extent is there some kind of permissioning here uh or is it completely you know anyone can deploy like any kind of application on base and uh and you know there's no restriction on bridging no kyc or like are you introducing any kind of you know sort of degrees of control um in base yeah so we think about base as a layer two and we think about layer twos as a scaling solution and extension of Ethereum. And if you look at our track record over the last year and a half, I think what you'll see is that Coinbase has been a very staunch defender of the permissionlessness of Ethereum, of the right for users and developers to write and run open source code, um, uh, of the right for people to run validators um, uh, and to have those validators execute that open source code. Um, you know, even on things like Tornado Cash, you know, Coinbase was, uh, you know, the one of, I think the first and biggest company to activate it around it. And we're supporting, a, um, you know, challenge that that's working its way through the court systems around the kind of open source uh, nature of this code and, and whether it's reasonable for Treasury to, you know, put open source code on a sanctions list. 
And so I think our plan for base is to extend and build on that permissionlessness. Um, there's obviously a complex path to that. Um, we're in the test net right now. We've written a lot about um, our path to decentralization. Um, if you want to read more about it, you can find it on our blog at base.mirror.xyz. Um, but we're working with Optimism to basically figure out how do we decentralize the underlying technology here of the OP stack as quickly as possible so that there's no multi-sig controlled by one individual or entity that can make decisions about the characteristics of the chain, the censorship of this chain. Um, there's, uh, you know, forced inclusion rights that are you know, upheld at the L1, that even if you have a sequencer that's misbehaving, um, transactions can still be processed. Um, and then we're, you know, decentralizing the sequencing layer. Uh, so that more people can be kind of uh, building blocks and, and submitting those transactions to the, to, to the broader L1 in batches. And so it's going to be a journey uh, as we work our way towards mainnet. We'll be continuing to communicate about it, but we believe in the you know permissionlessness of Ethereum. We see base as an extension of Ethereum and as a scaling solution on top of Ethereum. Uh, and, and you know we see that kind of holding across all our layer twos. And that's what we're going to be working to uphold from a decentralization uh, and open perspective over the next few months and years. So we're, we're, I think we're all familiar with kind of the uh, decentralization shortcomings of L2s. I think this is, this goes without saying, we all know this. And I think this is, uh, it's kind of a dead horse to beat because I mean, the, the, it's, I mean, everyone always says, look, we'll decentralize this. And I think techno technologically, this is possible and it, it will happen. But just to clarify, as is, does BASE have any other permissioning systems or settings that set it apart from the standard OP deployment? No, nope. we're running the standard OP deployment. Our goal is to continue upstreaming uh, all of our changes to the standard OP deployment uh, and work with Optimism to uh, release consistently across OP mainnet uh, and BASE and to have those operate on the same code base. Cool. I think this is what what Brian was kind of trying trying to get at. So basically, anyone can kind of deploy a DAP on base if they choose to do so. In principle, you can censor them from your interfaces, just like a, an app store doesn't have to show an app. Um, but you, you can't kind of exclude them fr from from the from the L two. That's super reassuring to hear. There's no mechanisms in the OP stack code base to do that, and um, you know, we're continuing to contribute to the OP stack code base, continuing to um, decentralize the OP stack code base. I think your your observation around kind of interfaces is exactly right. And this is what you see pretty consistently across the board um, with these layer twos and, and L1s as well, which is that um, if folks are hosting things like bridges uh, or they're hosting things, uh, yeah, I mean, like bridge, I think is a canonical example. Um, they're oftentimes or almost always applying some level of judgment around what kind of uh, users, whether it's based on IP or addresses, they want to let use those interfaces. Um, but then they're fighting to protect the permissionlessness of the underlying network, the smart contracts, the nodes. Um, that's what Optimism has done consistently. And um, that's what our, our plan is to do as well. Uh, we wanna be building with Optimism, building towards the centralization and treating layer two as an extension of Ethereum um, that protects the right for developers and users to run open source code. Just like people have been running code uh, on other systems for a long time, and just like the internet remains an open protocol that anyone can build on, uh, we see Ethereum kind of upholding the same standards. As as a centralized exchange, um, you have certain requirements, you know, from the regulators as to kind of funds and users you can onboard. So, where exactly do you draw the line between a user and a non-user of Coinbase if people kind of move around? on base, are those people automatically kind of users of Coinbase or can Coinbase users automatic, I mean, can can they just move around base freely? And how do you deal with kind of funds that you may not be able to kind of onboard onto Coinbase proper, but that have kind of come in contact or have come to belong to uh, Coinbase users on base? It, to me, it seems like um, really, difficult terrain to step in. Definitely very difficult terrain to step in. You know, I think Coinbase is at the vanguard 
of trying to figure out what is the where where are the lines and you know there's not going to be clear lines on any of this stuff like the the ways where the, the the laws that we're working with are um old and you know i think our our position has been pretty consistently like it's time to create new laws um that uh create regulatory certainty for developers uh create protections for users uh but also support innovation i think to your question um in particular around like kind of what's the difference between the centralized part of the business and the exchange and the kind of more decentralized software parts of the business um, you know, this is something that we've actually been dealing with for a, a long time. You know, if you look at Coinbase.com and uh, the Coinbase mobile app, those things are different than Coinbase Wallet, right? Coinbase.com and the Coinbase mobile app, you know, when you sign up, you create an account with a username and password, you give us your verified information, uh, we confirm that information, we do the KYC checks, um, we report on all of that. Uh, you know, within kind of the the, the guidelines that we're, we work with uh, from a regulatory perspective in different jurisdictions. Um, that's obviously been hugely successful for many users. Um, and it's different than Coinbase Wallet. If you download Coinbase Wallet today, you can download Coinbase Wallet anywhere in the world. You can use the software of Coinbase Wallet to generate a private key that is yours that you then use to interact with any application that's deployed on Ethereum and other networks too. Um, and Coinbase in that, uh, context is really providing software to let users manage their own information, their own data, their own uh, private keys uh, and transact uh, with, again, this open source software that's running on Ethereum as kind of a base layer. And our stance on that has been, again, people can and should run software uh, and that they should have rights protected around that. Um, and we're going to support them in doing that. And so I think that's going to be the same you know, uh, regulatory gray area or, you know, lack of clarity uh, that we're navigating with base. Um, and again, our goal is to build on and extend the kind of foundation that Ethereum has built uh, and see and treat layer two as an extension of that uh, and make sure that we're kind of upholding those values uh, because we think that that decentralization, that openness, that's what enables us to build a global crypto economy. That's what's going to enable us to bring a billion, people's on, p- billion people on chain um, and increase economic freedom everywhere. Cool. No, I really appreciate, uh, you know, the clear answer and, and uh, also the stance, right? I think that's really amazing that, like, you know, Coinbase is really building something, you know, fully open, permissionless. And yeah, so I think that's, that's very cool. One thing I'm curious about, of course, uh, an exchange or, you know, primarily an exchange building like uh, some kind of chain is, is not a new thing, right? I guess most known is like Binance, right? It has like the Binance chain uh, that I think kind of failed, right? But then Binance Smart Chain, which has been pretty successful. What are, are there some things that you learned or some things where you're like, okay, this, these are things we really want to do differently compared to how Binance has approached it? Yeah. Great question. And it, it, just as like context and historical data point, we've actually looked at building a chain twice before um, and we decided not to in 2018 and 2020. And the reason why we decided not to build a chain in those times is we didn't think that we could launch a chain that would live up to our values and beliefs about the crypto economy. And in particular, we didn't want to launch something that would put our users on an island. Um, or silo them or make them be disconnected from all of the other innovation that's happening and that they're using Coinbase products to access. And I think the thing that shifted now is we feel like we can. We feel like we can have both. We can both create the home for us on chain and be deeply interconnected to the broader crypto economy. Um, And I think as we look at, you know, other chains like Binance Smart Chain, um, that's probably the key difference in our philosophy and the approach that we're taking here. When I look at Binance Smart Chain, the thing that that gets me really excited and something that I think we've learned a lot from is the combination of having interfaces that people use, consumers, real consumers use, combined with a chain infrastructure that people can build applications on is super powerful. If you look at the activity that's happening on Binance Smart Chain, it is mostly small scale retail users doing small transactions, whether it's sends and receives of Tether um, or tr- swaps of, you know, like $10. Um, uh, it's, every, it's, it's everyday people 
um, actually using the chain. And that's because they have interfaces that enable them to use the chain. And that's why Binance Smart Chain has, I think, 10 million monthly transacting addresses, which is five times bigger than Ethereum and 10 times bigger than the next L2. And that's, I, I think that's incredible. It's an inc incredible illustration of how if you stop just forcing users to do things like pick the infrastructure that they want to run their apps on and instead just give them products and applications that they actually care about, they're going to use it. And that can drive real adoption of crypto. Now, I think our approach is like, let's take that learning and then let's figure out how to do it in a way where we're not off to the side. We're not creating our own siloed ecosystem, but instead we are using base almost as a bridge. And the value that we repeat over and over again is a bridge, not an island, which basically means that we think about base as the way that users are gonna come from off-chain to on-chain. And then the way that we're gonna enable users to go everywhere else. And we're gonna do that by continuing to support all these chains across our product. Uh, other L2s, Ethereum, other L1 ecosystems. We're going to do that by building really deep interoperability between base and Ethereum, between base and other L2s, between base and other L1 ecosystems like Cosmos, like Gnosis, like uh, Solana. Um, and I think our thesis, like we're at day zero in this story. There's still a small millions of real human beings who are transacting on chain every day. And we need to get that to a few billion transacting every day and in that it's going to take all kinds of innovation it's going to take a diversity of different solutions and we want to be bringing people in accelerating the growth of the broader crypto economy having base obviously play an important role in it but letting users and developers choose where they want to be building um, in a way that kind of lives up to the best uh, values of crypto and the openness and the interoperability that we we see making crypto such a special place i totally subscribe to that ethos but don't you know don't dismiss binance smart chain too quickly because what they what they're actually able to do is they, they do a lot of yeah you, you you never thought you'd hear that from me right but um <laughs> no i love uh, it I, I, don't, I don't feel like i'm dis dismissing binance smart chain i think binance smart chain is incredible i think that they've driven the most consumer adoption in the world of crypto right now and i mean the way that they're doing it is uh they're just able to do um, massive amount of transactions per second by, you know, by virtue of being pretty, you know, centralized. But I mean, same can be said for, for you know, the, the OP stack, but I, I know the roadmap and so on. But um, the numbers of transactions that um, you can do on an Optimism rollup is nowhere near the number of transactions you can do on Binance Smart Chain, right? So basically, if you have like 110 million users on Coinbase, how are they all going to fit onto your uh, rollup? Yeah, I, I mean, I think across the board, we have a lot of scaling challenges. I, 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 would, I challenge that Binance Smart Chain has some, you know, like meaningful uh, lead on other L2s or even other L1s like, like, like Gnosis. I mean, Binance Smart Chain is running on Get and uh, Aragon. Uh, you know, those are the same clients that we're using to run Ethereum, the same clients we're using to run these layer twos. Uh, and they've tweaked the gas limits a little bit. So they have higher gas limits, which, you know, has the, the downside of, you know, bloating data much faster, but the upside of creating a little bit more or significantly more throughput. But I, I, I don't think that there's like a meaningful technological advantage that Binance Smart Chain has over other L2s. And in fact, I think, I think what is more likely to happen is um, you know, almost like the tortoise versus the hare, right? If you look at layer two on Ethereum, there's actually a pretty clear path to driving down costs consistently um, because the biggest source of costs is L1 Ethereum data availability. And we're running this roadmap around 4844 proto dank sharding that's going to create a new kind of data availability on Ethereum that's going to be much cheaper to use. And then we can grow that capacity over time to continue driving down costs. Um, that's not the same situation for Binance Smart Chain. Like if they want to solve the like, how do we continue putting so many transactions through uh, Binance Smart Chain, but then manage with state growth, they're going to have to figure out how to do that at the L1 context, um, which is a, is a hard engineering problem. Um, and that's kind of why Ethereum has decided to pursue this roll-up centric scaling roadmap where you separate the concerns, you do data availability at L1, and then you push the execution down to L2. And so... I mean, I think I think time will tell, but 
Today, Binance Smart Chain is more expensive than other L2s. Um, maybe it has more throughput, but um, the costs are higher. And I think from a long-term perspective, uh, I at least feel a lot, a lot more confident in the scaling roadmap that um, folks like Ethereum uh, and Gnosis are running with 4844 uh, around providing data availability to L2s. I, I hear that. To me, the question is, so basically, invariably with an L2, your transaction costs um, are going to be um, correlated with, or I mean, proportional to the L1 fees, right? So basically, th there's, there's only so much um, you can um, ultimately settle to Ethereum, right? So basically, I mean, even if you, I mean, and we are now even talking about layer threes because basically layer twos are getting too expensive for many things. I recently spoke with um, Jordi um, from from Polygon. Um, he, this is actually, this interview is coming out after yours. So I, I can't, I basically no one will know this, um, but uh, basically th their plan is to kind of have like this system of chains and depending on what your actual um, requirements in terms of transaction costs and uh, uh, and security guarantees are, they will recommend you um, a different chain. So basically, basically, they will send you to uh, a Polygon ZK EVM or Polygon P POS or uh, you know any of the other ZK chains they're currently incubating. Do you think Base can kind of somehow toe the line? Uh, between, you know, between kind of excluding people on um, economic grounds in terms of transaction costs or excluding dApps? Or how, how, are you, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, good question. And, and first, the first thing I'll, I'll clarify is I think actually that with 4844, which is proto dank sharding, one of the really powerful things that's going to happen is we're going to now start to have two separate fee markets for L1. So we'll have the fee market for like transactions on L1 that are doing execution like a swap or a NFT mint or whatever. And that will continue to have the kind of like market driven de demand based on events. Like there's a big mint, you're going to see more spike, you're going to see higher gas costs. But then we're going to have this other market for blob space, which is just the data availability market. And that market isn't going to have the same kind of demand based uh, cur or uh, as intense demand curves because the primary use case is, is going to be L2s that are consistently publishing data. And so I think one of the things that we're actually going to see is we're going to see a, a divergence of the L2 costs from having that direct correlation to the L1 execution costs. And instead, what we'll see is over time, we're actually going to be able to drive down the L2 costs because we're going to be able to create more um, data availability through proto dank sharding and then full dank sharding that I, I think eventually should be basically infinite if we can solve the technology problems. Um, and that's going to mean we'll, we'll be able to continue uh, driving down costs. So I'd say that's, that's the first thing is like, I do think that there's a path to like lowering costs on L2s uh, consistently for the next decade um, in a way that will get really cheap fees. Um, the other thing that I'll say is I, I actually totally agree with Jordy's perspective. And, you know, we, we've uh, talked about this a lot with optimism. Um, we don't think any one chain is going to be the answer. Crypto is too big. We have to bring a billion people on chain. And uh, not only is that a huge amount of demand, but you also have applications that are, you know, just have really different requirements in terms of how they run. And the mental model that I have for this is, this, this mental model of Web2. If you look at the average kind of developer life cycle of a Web2 business, maybe they start on like a shared hosting solution, you know, like a Heroku, and then that gets too expensive for them or it's too slow. And they're like, okay, now we're gonna go to AWS and we're gonna run our own computers on AWS that are virtualized. Um, and that works really well for them. And then they get big enough at some point and they're like, wow, like it's too expensive for us to be on AWS. Now we're gonna get our own data center. And we're going to have our own data center. We're going to invest in the hardware. We're going to fine tune it. We're going to make it work specifically for our use case. I actually think applications in crypto will go through a similar trajectory where they'll start on a shared chain and it will be like, oh, now we can like get easy access to all the liquidity and it'll all just work. And it's really easy to deploy. And then after a certain point, they'll be like, wow, now we're on this chain and we're like paying all these gas fees and it's not really working perfectly for us. And we've scaled and we have millions of users. 
what if we would be better served by running our own instance of this stack and having it interoperate with that other chain and still have the same API or interface available to users through that other chain, but have our own kind of custom stack that's powering the underlying business logic. And I, I expect that to happen. And that's why we're building on the OP stack. That's why we have this vision of a super chain where what will happen over the next five years is we're basically gonna have thousands, millions of chains that have different use cases um, that serve different kind of application developer needs and that all kind of fit together through interoperability so that the user, they aren't having to make choices of like, am I running on this one or that one? Just like you don't make choices around like what's my tier one versus tier two ISP as I'm connected to the internet. Instead, they just run the applications that they care about and the kind of abstraction of the super chain, however that shapes up to be, make sure that that's executed in, in the right place. And so I, I think Polygon, you know, I, I talk, spent a lot of time with Polygon. I think their vision, our vision, and the Cosmos vision, like everything's kind of converging um, to this idea that there's gonna be many of these things, they're gonna interoperate, uh, they're gonna have different configurations of, of data availability, and that mesh is gonna be the thing that enables crypto to grow to billions of users. I think the places where there's difference in differences in perspective are, you know, what exactly is the technology that we're gonna use to coordinate those things? Where exactly is the data availability gonna live? Um, what are the kind of foundational validator sets or, uh, you know, uh, trust networks that secure different parts of the system? Um, people have different perspectives there, but I actually think from a like architecture perspective, we're generally converging. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have talked, we've mentioned quite a bit, you know, the OP stack, you guys building on that and on, optimi uh, on optimism. Now, of course, that's not the only layer two technology there is. I mean, uh, Arbitrum is, of course, the other um, roll-up that today, uh, you know, is live and has significant traction. And then there's a lot of other things coming, right, with more like based on ZK technology. So w why did you guys decide to go with the OP stack? So one note on the OP stack and just kind of optimism, ver optimistic versus ZK rollups generally is I think we don't think about this as like an optimistic or ZK rollup uh, question. Um, I think our thesis is that as these technologies mature, basically what's going to happen is because they're all open source, because this is all being done in the open, we're going to be able to bring together the best of all of these things to upgrade the chains. And so as we've been building base and as we've been kind of doubling down on the OP stack, I think the key thing that we've really optimized for is how do we create a modular foundation for this chain so that as the technology matures, we can plug in the things that make it better. And so an example of this is we're starting with uh, optimistic fault prover. Uh, that's going to be the thing that kind of secures the network. But that prover component of the OP stack is a module. And the second we have a ZK EVM that's mature enough, uh, we can add that in either in a multi-prover setup or as a replacement for the optimistic prover. And I think we believe that over the next few years, we're basically going to increment to the upgrade this thing so that sometime in 2024, 2025, we're going to have many provers running in parallel that are going to provide more resiliency, more redundancy on the system, um, lower finality time between L1 and L2, and make it so no failure in one place, you know, risks user funds. So that kind of mental model of like, this isn't optimistic or ZK rollup, but instead it's like optimistic and ZK rollup. Uh, and it's like, how do we build the system to be upgradable so it can be flexible to those technology improvements, I think has been the guiding kind of North Star for us as we've been building base. In terms of why optimism in the OP stack specifically, I'd say there's really four reasons. Um, the first reason is this kind of technology question. It's like, you know, how did we get to, how, how do we make sure we're building on a sufficiently modular, sufficiently strong foundation um, for what we think will be many, many years of iteration in terms of making this chain high quality? Um, and, and we feel great about the collaboration with Optimism there. Although the thing I'll also say is we also feel great about all the other incredible work that's happening in the industry. You know, the work that Arbitrum is doing is totally cutting edge. Uh, they've been leading the way on the fault prover. Um, scroll, in terms of having a ZK EVM that's EVM equivalent, I think they're really pushing boundaries. Polygon, in terms of just moving quickly, uh, getting things out the door, uh, you know, huge inspiration there. And I think our goal is to not just work with optimism, but to work with all of these teams. 
to figure out how do we bring the best of these technologies together to scale the crypto economy and make it possible for a million builders to create the applications that bring a billion users on chain. Um, but anyways, the first one is technology. I'd say the second big uh, reason why we're working with Optimism is the kind of licensing and open source approach of the OP stack. Um, Ethereum is open source freely available. Uh, that's been the thing that has both driven so much of the innovation that's happened around Ethereum because people could fork and experiment with it. And I think been so essential to protecting that permissionlessness and openness that we talked about earlier. And I think Optimism's approach with the OP stack is the same. And that felt really important to us. We wanted to be taking our resources and not putting them into a silo or a thing that was just benefiting Coinbase, but instead putting them into something that was open source, something that was freely available and something that anyone could benefit from, whether they wanted to join in with us and build or fork. Um, so that kind of open source ethos was the second reason. The third reason was uh, Optimism's uh, work and thinking around funding public goods. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know, but they've been running these retroactive public goods funding rounds um, and in general kind of pushing the boundaries of like, how can we make sure that we're getting the money that's created in these systems back to the underlying infrastructure, whether it's core internet infrastructure or Ethereum infrastructure like GAP and Nethermind and Aragon or the OP stack infrastructure. And so contributing to that and being a part of it um, and supporting those public goods felt really important to us. Um, that's also why we're contributing a portion of the revenue that base generates from transaction fees back to that retroactive public goods funding mechanism through the Optimism Collective. So that was the third reason. And then the fourth reason was we started working with Optimism a little bit more than a year ago on EIP 4844, uh, which again is this upgrade to Ethereum. That was before we started working on base. We didn't know we were going to build an L2 at that time. Um, we were just wanting to scale Ethereum because we felt like scaling Ethereum was going to help the industry, which was going to help Coinbase. I think through that context of like working on Ethereum together and writing code and writing docs and like collaborating, we, we built trust. We got to know each other. We got to feel out each other and be like, do we work well together? And what I think we saw was like, yeah, we work well together. And this has actually been a consistent pattern that we've seen, which is that the shelling point of Ethereum from a collaboration perspective of finding people and starting there and being like, let's work on Ethereum because we know it's going to be good for all of us. And then as we do that and as we build that context, how do we kind of add on additional collaborations? Um, I think that's been a really powerful approach that has consistently brought us great people who we love working with. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super interesting. It's funny. I've I've actually never heard this. Uh, uh, I mean, basically building upgradable um, infrastructure or uh, protocols. This is uh, is super difficult because you kind of you have to know where you w want to be able to upgrade, right? You don't want to be able to upgrade everything. So how f how far have you planned this out to kind of upgrade base into a zk rollup? Because basically, from an engineering perspective. Um, that's, that seems incredibly complex and really difficult to kind of lay out. So basically to me, it would seem it might, it, I mean, from an engine, you know, from practical perspective, it might even be easier to just redeploy uh, a new roll up uh, that's kind of innately ZK, uh, you know, rather than kind of ensuring that you can upgrade in all the right places. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of hard technology problems to solve here. Um, but I think one of our goals and theses here is this is a long-term investment. It's a long-term project. We're going to measure our success on the order of years, um, just like Ethereum has measured its success on the order of years. And I think, you know, we've been inspired by Ethereum's ability to um, consistently make progress and upgrade itself, even as um, that has been a real challenge. You know, sometimes it's taken longer than we might want, but that uh, uh, malleability uh, and the ability to evolve, I think has, has been uh, you know, very inspiring for us. In terms of like the specific technology side, you know, I think the way we've been building the open stack is to have as much modularity as possible around the proving layer and around the data availability layer, because those are the things that feel like, uh, from our perspective, they're the most well-defined in terms of places that we will want to upgrade and evolve. Um, data availability right now is obviously going to be Ethereum, um, but we want to make it so people can also use the OP stack 
to not run on Ethereum, whether that's putting their data on other L1 or putting their data in a data availability committee that's going to allow them to run it much faster and have much lower fees. So I'd say, and then on the proving side, we already talked about this, you know, thinking about optimistic rollups versus ZK rollups. So I'd say those are the two areas that we focus most on from an upgradability perspective. Um, in terms of the exact ZK, uh, you know, path there, I think it's I think it's very possible. I think one of the things that we definitely feel is like it's the it's not the expertise that we have at Coinbase, and I also don't think it's the expertise that um, Optimism has at OP Labs or the Optimism Foundation. I think this one like that, that at, at some in some ways that feels like a risk. In some ways, it also feels like exciting to us. It's like what that means is there's space for more people to be building with us. You know, there's space for other teams to say, hey, wow, this is a valuable selling point. Like, let's figure out how to make this work. Um, and we're, you know, we're having some of those conversations today. Um, and I think that there's a very real path to both bringing the technology, but also bringing the talent um, together to contribute to, you know, this open source, um, interoperable, freely available toolkit that's starting to kind of shape up to, to scale Ethereum uh, and the broader crypto economy. One of the other drawbacks of optimism is kind of the withdrawal period, right? So basically, um, I think it's pretty well known that uh, when you kind of want to withdraw something from an optimistic rollup, you have like this wait period of one week. And for many assets, this isn't really that much of that big of a deal because you can have like a liquidity protocol that kind of operates on top of it. Um, but it's a major um, usability problem for everything that's non-fungible or illiquid right so basically so if you have um an nft or any sort of um, attestation or social graph or whatever and you want to bring it down from this optimistic rollup onto another optimistic rollup or layer one or another layer one um that's you're, you're locked in for a week and anyway how, how are you guys thinking about that yeah i think definitely a challenge and, you know, to your point, like for fungible assets, this is much less of a challenge because, uh, you know, we, you can do kind of liquidity bridging across them. And Coinbase has a product that makes it so anyone can bring assets from Optimism to Ethereum or Polygon to Ethereum or Arbitrum to Ethereum um, instantly. Uh, and I think we've seen that that's pretty consistently been like the solution for users and they've appreciated that. On the non-fungible side, I think, I think you're exactly right. We have work to do here. Um, it's, you know, one thing that gives me a little bit of solace is people are used to waiting absurd amounts of times for some of these things in the existing financial system. Right? If you think about like getting a loan or, uh, you know, getting your identity verified by the DMV, like people's, uh, expectation bar for getting that like final check if they want to move somewhere else, um, is pretty low today. So I think that that gives us time to solve this as we get there. I, I think that there's some paths that we could follow, like obviously, um, you know, upgrading uh, or in incorporating a ZK rollup can lower the finality there. Um, I think that there are things around L2 to L2 uh, interoperability that can get us faster than, than kind of the L1 finality uh, through shared sequencing. And I'm really excited about that. And I think the, the thesis that I generally have is most users, sometime in the next little while, we'll start to onboard directly onto L1, uh, L2 and live directly on L2. And they'll, we won't actually have that many reasons to go to L1 um, unless they're you know, large scale business users who will probably be already on L1. And in that world, you know, if you're on one L2, great. Like, you know, you don't run into that issue. If you're on other L2s, I think that there's a path for us to get more interoperability there that has lower finality. So definitely a hard problem, definitely one that we think needs to get solved in order to you know, provide the ideal user experience here, but also one that we think we will be able to solve with time. Cool. So um, let's talk about the DAP developers um, who will deploy to base. So I assume in the beginning, this will mostly be cross deployments of things that already run on other um, chains. So how, how do you go about not 
starting on an empty chain, right? Because if if if, the, on, the, if on day one, you kind of o- open a mall uh, and say, this is our decentralized mall, everyone go look at it and everything's empty. <laughs> There's nothing there. Kind of sucks, right? Yeah. So sad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, how do you go about kind of creating this day one experience for your currently um, centralized users? Yeah. Um, so w- w- one thing I'll note is, you know, like the natural course of chain is you do have some inevitable phasing that has to happen. Like you have to do Genesis and you have to get some infrastructure on there and that supports other infrastructure and that supports inf- other infrastructure and that supports the product. So I expect like we're not going to on day one have literally everything ready to go because Aave depends on Uniswap and, you know, Coinbase wallet interface for borrowing depends on Aave and we need to get all those things sequenced. So I expect like there will be a one to three month period where we're going to be doing that bootstrapping. In terms of like, you know, if we think about that as just kind of a given for any chain, how do we make sure that at the end of that bootstrapping, the that base is a lively, exciting place that people want to be? Um, you know, one of our values is that base is for everyone. And we've tried to embody that as best we could pre-announcement. Um, we're going to con- try and embody that as best we can post-announcement as well. And so I think we went out on last Thursday with something like 70 builders who committed to be building on base. Um, that includes basically every kind of blue chip protocol in the space, a ton of different infrastructure providers, so multiple block explorers, multiple node providers, um, multiple data providers, multiple NFT data providers. Um, and that multiple thing has been really important to us. One thing that we really wanted to make sure was that we weren't making everything just Coinbase. So it wasn't just like first party, first party, first party, because that felt like it would set everything off on a wrong tone and basis for everyone. And that we weren't making it a winner take all or like a king making situation where we were like hand picking someone and, you know, that person was going to go and kind of take all the value. And so for every category, our goal was to get at least three people that we felt like could be kind of a viable option for, for builders and users who are coming on chain. And, and we achieved that in the opening um, kind of announcement and the folks who have already committed to building. I think post launch, We've been, I mean, it exceeded my wildest expectations in terms of the amount of demand and inbound that we've had over the last five days um, has been a fire hose. Uh, we're at East Denver this week. Um, I'm doing this from my hotel room uh, and similarly feels like a little bit of a fire hose. I think people see the potential um, for what we can do if we you know, connect up the Coinbase distribution, connect up the Coinbase experiences to the on-chain economy and they want to be a part of that. And so obviously there's a lot of work for us to do in terms of making sure that those folks, you know, get situated, that they have the right tooling, that they have the right infrastructure, that they have the right documentation. Um, but I think we're off to a really good start. Um, I'm about to go do a workshop with, you know, a bunch of builders in East Denver to help them build on base. Um, this week, I'm just going to be literally on the ground, meeting people, connecting with people, being as helpful as I possibly can be um, and hammering home this value that we have, which is that base is for everyone. Um, it's an open ecosystem. It's not just Coinbase. It's not Coinbase chain. Um, it is base uh, and base is for everyone. How many of these uh, uh, audio base are belong to us uh, jokes are you getting? <laughs> Lots. Yeah, I mean, our, our first yeah, tweet. I can imagine. <laughs> the, the, the first tweet that we did was all, all, all your base are belong to you, which felt much more like, you know, we don't own your base. You own your base basis for everyone um we actually we we tried to put that in the um genesis block for the test net but we messed up and so it's not the genesis block for the test net <laughs> that was the plan um we'll see if we put it in the genesis block for the main net we might put something else we're still deciding um yeah i mean i think one of the things we love about the name base i mean there's two things we love about the name base lot i mean so many things we love about the name base one is that it's just like spiritually connected to coinbase you know it's like of Coinbase, but not Coinbase, um, which feels really meaningful to us. Two is that obviously it's connected to this meaning of like foundation um, of kind of being this essential part of the broader crypto economy and platform. Um, And then three, it is like the most memeable uh, meme word ever. Like the number of based memes 
and all your all your all your base are belong to you memes we have a whole meme channel at coinbase that i haven't yet gotten permission to just share publicly um, where people have just been baking base memes um, we've tried to build on that meme ability with the blue dot which we think has worked pretty well um, but in general like there's so much great content to be created here and uh, we think that that kind of content is the stuff that's going to bring in the everyday people um, uh, to come use base and that's who we need if we want to get to a billion people on chain it's going to take a lot of memes absolutely you mentioned mainnet launch uh, maybe final question here i mean what is the timeline for mainnet launch and maybe if there are any other major milestones that are coming up for base yeah so we're, we're working to get to mainnet as quickly and safely as possible um hopefully in the next few months one of the things that we, uh, you know, I think benefit from here is like we're not running this chain. Like this is not the first test net for this chain. This is not for the technology that's powering the chain. We're not like off on our own doing this. Um, and so that's going to have us uh, let us have a shorter test net period than potentially other things that are coming to market because we have that re re resiliency, redundancy, and the battle testing that's already happened in other ecosystems. Um, I think Optimism is currently planning to bring Bedrock, uh, which is kind of the, the release that we're running on to mainnet in mid, late April. Um, and we'll fast follow them. Um, uh, so no specific timeline, but next few months is what we're aiming for. Um, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of anticipation. Um, we're going to do it as quickly and safely as we can and get base in the hands of builders so that they can start building. And our my goal, it's not, I haven't set the goal yet but it's uh, the framing that i've been working with is a bill uh, a million builders on base in 2023 a billion people on base in 2024 wow okay i like that that's a good that's an audacious goal and uh <laughs> we gotta, we have, one of these days it's gonna happen <laughs> yeah like, it, it really does feel like we've been you know like coin uh, crypto has been kind of like working its way but at a certain point, the, the platform is going to work. You know, we're going to have the right wallets. We're going to have the right identity tools. We're going to have the right uh, wallet infrastructure. We're going to have the right chain infrastructure. It's going to be low cost enough. And to me, it really feels like this is the year where those pieces are finally like almost ready. Like they're in sight and we just need to push a little bit harder to get them all to work really well together. And that's going to be this catalyst that will drive the next you know, billion people on chain. Cool. Well, Jesse, thanks so much for coming on. It's been really a pleasure to speak with you. I think you did an excellent job at sort of explaining to us what BASE is. And and I think one thing also really appreciated, you know, like emphasizing again sort of, you know, the values behind that and Coinbase's values. And I think for sure I agree that, you know, Coinbase has been doing, you know, a, a very important job, right, in like trying to like push back a bit against like all the horrible uh, regulatory ideas and Gary Gensler and whatnot is coming. Uh, so I think that's, you know, really important, right? And hopefully uh, you guys will continue to do that work and advocate for, you know, free and open decentralized systems and open financial systems. So thanks so much and really excited to see how base is going to develop and how are we going to, how are you going to fare on these, uh, these targets that you guys are, uh, have set. Well, I appreciate y'all uh, having me on. Excited to help people build on base. Cool. Thanks so much, Jesse. And thanks so much for listeners for tuning in. If you want to support the show, leave us a review on iTunes or tweet about it, share it uh, on Twitter. And yeah, we're excited to be back next week.